Find out what pleases the Lord. We don't normally pursue finding out what we already know, right? Box is already checked, done. We already know what pleases God, right? Come on, be good, do what he says. We, we know all of this. It, when you're in Walmart and if the cashier were to perhaps give you more change than you needed or, you know, called for, you give it back, right? That's the God-pleasing thing to do. Right? Okay, all right. Now, and, and then, you, you, of course, when you see someone hurting like a child, you, you stop and help. You're patient with the annoying, impatient customer, not simply because it's good business, but because it pleases the Lord. You're generous with your time and your money, all pleasing to God. And this past week, we got to see somebody get recognized on a world stage as somebody who pleased God, right? I mean, the Roman Catholic Church acknowledged Mother Teresa in all of her God-pleasing activities. And, and even if you're not Catholic, you could certainly agree that what she's done for the poorest of the poor in India, oh yeah, that's God-pleasing. And not only do we know what pleases the Lord, we know what makes him mad. We got that down. You just look at some of these passages like, well, you can be sure of this. No immoral, impure, greedy person, such as a person as an idolater, has any place in the kingdom of Christ or of God. Oh yeah, God's wrath is coming down on all of those who are disobedient. When I was younger, I mean much younger, and was sitting in Sunday school class, these kind of passages that talked about what made God pleased and what made him mad, I took special attention to pay, you know, special care about what was being said because I knew <laughs> where bad people went. Yeah. And... And, and I was quite concerned at that time of my life that I might just join them in hell because I knew that my life was not pleasing to God. But I kind of took stock of what I was doing because it certainly was obvious to my parents and my teachers and my uh, principals that I was not leaving a God-pleasing life. And so I tried extra hard then to find out what would please God and everyone else and then I tried real hard to do it. And, and you know, that, that seemed to kind of work out in my mind. And I thought God was pretty okay with it too because I made sure that I let him know that I believed in him. You know, you can't please God unless you have faith in him. And then, you know, if you seek him, he rewards you. So it seemed like a done deal. You know, pack it away, got this figured out until my pastor found out what I was trying to do. I know. And he came up to me and he said, you know, you don't get into heaven because you're afraid of going to hell. I, I'm like, what? You know, how do you, how'd you know that? You know, I, what, what? And, 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 and I, what? I just didn't understand why he would be saying that, so I asked him to repeat it, and he says, you don't get into heaven because you're afraid of going to hell. Well, that just threw me to the ground because I had kind of worked things out, you know, this deal with God and, I, and it pressed my young soul almost to the breaking point because I knew, I knew even as a young person what was motivating my spiritual fervor at the time and it was fear of God's judgment. And, and I knew it wasn't just me. I saw other people doing the same thing. You know, there was this older couple in town, and they started to, to come to church again. They hadn't been there for years, maybe decades. And then, boom, there they are, every Sunday, faithful. Now, in a small town, this kind of thing is noticed and talked about. And I happened to have overheard what was said, and this is what was said. Well, you know the reason they're back in church, right? They're old and they're afraid of going to hell. <laughs> as a young person, I heard this, and, and even though it was a snarky comment, I took it as a gospel fact. 
not as a tongue-in-cheek, you know, comment of just, well, I'm glad they're back. And so as I saw other people really trying hard to please God and get in good with Him, I thought, that's what you do. And <sighs> Take heart, though, and take a deep breath, because I, I did finally found myself on some firm ground, and I finally heard some really good news. Did you know that God forgives all of your sins? I know. Well, of course, I'm being silly. You know that. But at the time, I hadn't put it all together. And then finally now, all those Bible stories we've been learning in Sunday school about all those really bad people, God forgave them. You know, like David and Bathsheba. Mm-hmm. Peter and his denial of Jesus. Thomas and his doubting the woman caught in the act of adultery, scarlet letter and all, God forgave them. <sighs> well, that really set my heart, my soul, everything at ease. And, and I'm sure I could have gotten along just fine in life if it hadn't been for the Jaws music. You're familiar with the old that whole horror movie and, and the dun 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 yeah, well, I could hear it. And, and, I, and you know that, that ominous Jaws music, that something bad is coming for you. Well, I could hear it. And, and really what it was, was that, yeah, I believe that God forgave me all my sins. But I, I also knew that this was probably a limited agreement with him. That at any point, he was just kind of putting up with me. And, and even begrudgingly so. And at any point, he was just going to say, enough. Enough is enough. I have forgiven you for the last time. These are the same sins that you confessed the day before. Now you're doing them again. I'm done. We're through. Chomp. Yeah. So, there, there I was. And, you know, the... the when you find out what pleases God, it's not what you think. It's not the answer that just seems quite as obvious at first that, well, just be good, do what he says. You see, you never know how these words are going to be heard by people in a congregation. There's all kinds of people here tonight. Hundreds of people will hear this message tonight and who knows what a young person is thinking right now. Who knows what a lifetime Lutheran is thinking right now? Who knows what you're thinking? Because everybody has this different picture of God. Some people see God as this hard to please parent. Just always a little bit irritated. Nothing's ever good enough. And that at any moment there could be this blow up. Cue the Jaws music for that person. Other people, they're always kind of trying to make a deal with God, you know, and keep themselves out of hell and high water. And, and every religious fervor thing they do, it's, it's really motivated out of a, a fear of God's judgment and self-preservation. And some people, heaven help them, I don't know where they get this from, but they have, they have this picture of God that's just... He's just this warm, fuzzy, floppy thing that they would never be mad at anything. They, God is just pleased no matter what they do. Where are you getting that? But that's where they are. And, and you know, you think about it. The, the person who is filled with fear, the deal maker, the, the clueless, disobedient person, they're really just different versions of a heart that is lost and unable to find their way. Now, when we typically think of the lost, we're thinking somebody, you know, in, in India who's a Hindu. We don't think of somebody who's sitting in a church who can say the Apostles' Creed and mean it. We don't think of somebody who has this great desire to serve and shows up at everything a church does and we don't normally think in those terms. But the only hope for the lost, because they're lost nonetheless, the only hope for the lost is to be found 
And that's the reason that Jesus welcomed sinners and ate with them and was pursuing them because he and he alone could change the heart from this fear-filled, deal-making, reckless disobedience. You know, the hardest people to find, though, are those who don't believe that they're lost. And so I want to spend just a moment talking about what do I mean by the lost and what do I mean by the found. Because being found is not necessarily the fact that you've heard Jesus loves you and forgives all of your sins. Being found isn't the complete story of forgiveness. Being found is about the Jaws music. And how you answer the question, what pleases the Lord? See, there's only one answer that will give us confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. And it's not a teaching. It's not some a story that you can hear and agree to. Oh, well, that's what happened. I, I believe in that. It's not, uh, uh, well, I've joined this church or I've done this thing. There's only one answer that truly gives us confidence and assurance, and it's not a thing, it's a person, and it's Jesus. Being found is when you have been given this gift of faith of eyes to see that Jesus has found you, that he's right there with you, and that he's for you. There's now no condemnation. And that you're with him, not in a moment, but in a lifetime. Here, there is more joy in heaven when one sinner repents from the fear-filled, deal-making, reckless, clueless disobedience and has been found by Jesus. Because here, then, in this life with Jesus, there, there truly is this lifelong learning. It, it's not something you can just pick up in a sermon or even the 10 weeks we're going to spend together and think, well, that's done. I've learned everything there is that will please God. This is just one more step along the way of a lifetime of learning from Jesus who is with you of what, in fact, pleases God. But here, here's a taste the life that pleases God is first and foremost a life of faith in which a faith has been a gift given, a faith that believes that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, without reservation, loves you, delights in you, treasures you. And are, you re are you ready for this one? likes you. I know. Not just putting up with you. Not just a little bit chapped, but okay, I can, I can suffer through this. Wholehearted. Unreserved. What, what more must he do to convince your heart he gave his son into death? Find out what pleases the Lord. It is a life of faith, this gift of faith that believes that God is for you and has your best interest in mind, and that he indeed is working all things for your eternal good, all things, things that just will not make sense here on this side of heaven, things that have been painful or uh, incomprehensible. He's working all things, not so that they make sense or so that it all feels good, but for your eternal good so that you continue to be with him as you are now, continue to be with him forever and ever. And that even here in this place, you are safe and that nothing in all creation, not the Zika virus, not a terrorist attack, not even an economic boom or bust, a job loss, not height nor depths, demons, nothing can separate you from the love 
of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now what keeps us from being just this warm, fuzzy, floppy God that is just pleased with you no matter what you do is the next. Is that what pleases God is a faith that trusts wholeheartedly that the best possible life that one can have this side of heaven is the one in which the person dies to themselves. I die to my need for revenge. I, I die to my need for all my little pettiness, for all my grievances against you and you and you and you. For all the things that have hurt me, I put all of that to death at my need to get back. I put to death all of the vices of greed and lust. All of the things which is completely possible, not because I've tried real hard to do it, but because I'm with Jesus. He's the power. He's the love. He's the one who changes my heart from deal-making fear-filled, careless and clueless, to so in love that I want to know what pleases you, Jesus, so that I can love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I can love my neighbor as I love myself. That's what pleases God. It is the gift given. Now, you and I are people who live in a physical body, right? We're not just spirits floating around. And because we have a physical body, we got problems. It has desires. It has stuff and problems. And it has habits already trained. So that your body can get angry that quickly. Your body can get to be afraid that quickly. Your body is a problem that needs training. And as you are with Jesus, he's part of the training. So during this Find Out series, you're going to have spiritual exercises. You can almost cross out the word spiritual and just put exercises for your physical body, which in an indirect way allow the Holy Spirit to work in you a life that is ever closer to God. So this week, you're going to have an opportunity for a sermon take home. Uh, it's on the table back there. Take one as you go home. But you actually don't even need to take home, but you can take it. It's Psalm 23, and, and the spiritual practice is to meditate. You already know how to meditate. If you've ever worried about anything, you got meditating down. It's what you just keep thinking about. You just keep thinking about it. Putting Psalm 23 before your eyes. This is my life. I have a God who's shepherding me. I have no needs. The only need I have is Him. He makes me to lie down. Now, all the Psalm 23, keep it before yourself. Meditate on it this week as a practice because you've got a physical body that needs the training. May the Lord bless all of us then as we continue to find out. Amen.